It's such an honor to be here tonight with a woman whose career I've followed for my entire life. I've always, I knew growing up in Brooklyn, New York, that I wanted to be a journalist. I grew up reading your work uh, in New York Magazine. And of course, I couldn't help but notice that every single household in the world had a copy of Passages. And finally, one day I read it and it informed my life, and, and uh, I've always admired you, so I'm honored to be Thank here. Thank you. You must have read your mother's copy. <laughs> <laughs> I think I did. I think I did. did. You? She, yeah, uh, but many others, too, along the way. Many others along the way. Um, Thank you. It's one of those books you pick up time again. I assume many of you are here because you're familiar with passages. Is that true? Or Yeah. Good. <laughs> Good. Thank you. I think that's where I want to start <clears throat> talking with you, just because it was such a defining moment in your career. And in your memoir, um, and I want to talk a little bit about that down the road, about what it's like to write about yourself after all these years and all these other books. Scary. Um, <laughs> must have been terrifying. Yeah. Um, I, and this is, Passages is considered, uh, Library of Congress survey called it one of the 10 most influential books of all time? Well, our time, of our time. Okay, that's pretty good still. <laughs> it's pretty good, yeah. Did M you? Totally, totally unexpected right. on so my part. You didn't know when you were writing it what you were creating. No, I, I, was, I was obsessed with the subject because here it was, um, Eric Erickson had started laying out adult development. Nobody had ever even conceived of development continuing stages through adult life. So Eric Erickson did three stages. He just named them, three stages in adult life, and asked other people to flesh them out. So, you know, I took up the, the, uh, the dare, and <clears throat> being a journalist and having written four books, but not having a, a medical degree or a psych psychiatric practice, <clears throat> and what I discovered was the only people who were researching this subject were a few men in Ivy League universities studying other men. <laughs> um, and I thought that, you know, that leaves something out. Uh, so I went to talk to Dan Levinson at Yale, who was a wonderful uh, scholar, but he was studying 34 men, and his thesis was that, <clears throat> that life, adult life had to proceed, if it was going to be healthy, from A to B to C to D stages in sequence. I said, well, Dan, you know, women, that's then all women would be crazy because we are always adapting to other people. So we go from A to C and we do a little bit of B and then maybe we go back to A, maybe we never get back to B, we get to D. And he said, that fits, that's nice. And I said, and then uh, that would have a lot to do with couples because if she's going through her stages at a different time and with different issues than he is, all life cycles are not based on the male life cycle, it, that's the way it looks. And so that would explain a lot of the clashes between men and women and predictable times of divorce. And he said, well, you should do that. You should work on that. So I did. And uh, it, it became, as I say, an obsession because it was like you know, mining a completely new cultural country. Yes, and you were personally excavating yourself or extricating yourself from a relationship at that time because you knew you needed the solitude. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I found that very interesting and then we can get more into clay later Right, on. well, <clears throat> it, all, it all started when I was 32 <clears throat> and I insisted that my editor <clears throat> and at that time romantic partner, Clay Felker, who started New York Magazine, send me to Northern Ireland at the peak of the Troubles. And he said, why? And I said, because, you know, that's exactly it. You always said you have to find the why behind a big story. And why is the British Army at the throats of Irish Catholics and vice versa? And he said, what does that have to do with New York? And I said, well, half the population of New York is Irish, Irish. isn't it? But this is the real story is the women. It's the women who are doing the fighting because they're, their men are in jail. They're even shooting British soldiers. He said, well, that's a story. Okay, so he sent me. <clears throat> well, I get there, and I, it all happened so fast. I, I, couldn't, I still can't quite believe what happened. 
we, there was a peaceful civil rights march on a beautiful sunny Sunday afternoon. Down the hill, did, we did all the things that you're supposed to do in these, in these nasty games. We met the British Army at the barricades. They threw their tear gas bombs. We vomited the tear gas back. We dragged those dented from rubber bullets back to safety. And then everything was all over. Everybody dropped back to a nice square in the bog side. And I wanted to get a better view, so I climbed up an outdoor staircase on the outside of flats. I'm standing next to a young boy, about 14, and I'm saying, you know, how did the paratroopers fire their gas canisters so far? And he says, see them jamming their rifle bullets in the ground? And all of a sudden, a bullet comes out of nowhere and right into his face. I, you know, bent over him, he fell to the ground, and I thought, how can I mend him? Because up until that time in my young life, I thought everything could be fixed. But all of a sudden, there, there was crossfire. Um, there were IRA sharpshooters in the roof, so they began exchanging fire. The British paratroopers jumped out of their Saracens. They plowed into the crowd with high-velocity rifle fire, spraying civilians with no arms. It was terrifying. And so and all of a sudden, people... Uh, piled in on us, we were kind of wound up like a caterpillar, inching up our, on, on our bellies up the steps. We couldn't even drag the young boy who was dying. We could, but we, we did. But somebody was going to have to leap out in crossfire and bang on a door to get us taken into safety. Well, it wasn't going to be me, except then a bullet just passed right in front of my nose. It's almost like it was just suspended in midair and stupefied, and I watched it embed itself in the brick wall. And then I did crawl out and cross fire and bang on a door. And we were taken in. And after the massacre, 13 people killed, I <clears throat> went down, an Irish, an IRA commander came over and he said, I'll have to take your film, lass. And I said, but you're not taking my tape recorder. It was open during the whole time. He said, good lass. And he sent me to a phone to report my story. And um, I called Clay. He was at home in bed, safe in New York City, and I said, he said, how's the story coming? I said, well, uh, 13 people were mur murdered here today. He said, wait a minute, CBS is right, talking about it right now on TV. And I said, Clay, they're calling it Bloody Sunday. He said, now honey, look, I, this is a story on the Irish women. Just, you don't have to be in the front lines. Just stay with the women and stay safe, okay? <laughs> well, that was the first time Clay didn't get it. And I went back, I was taken to a safe house. There was an old woman there, they were playing, she and her husband, playing the Long Cash prison songs at the top of their uh, volume on an old Victrola as the British soldiers were patrolling the streets and kicking in the doors to look for IRA and weapons. I said, what are you gonna do if they come in here looking for your son who just went over the border? And she said, lie on me stomach. So we all laid on our stomachs and um, it was a terrifying, thought that I had. I thought, you know, there's no one who will ever keep me safe, no one who's always going to look out for me. Uh, and the same with everybody else. It was just confronting my mortality for the first time when I was only 32. And it brought on a premature midlife crisis. Um, when I got home and six months later, the crisis erupted. I was at the Democratic National Convention in Miami and I went out on the balcony, and there was a full moon and an eclipse, and um, I opened my suitcase, and there was red, looked like red blood all over the top of it, but it was just red heels that had bled in the heat, and, but it just shocked me so much. It was the boy's face all over again, so I really had a kind of a breakdown, and um, it would, we'd call it today post-traumatic stress syndrome, but we didn't know about it then. So... Um, <clears throat> I determined that well, once I got back to New York and I began to look through the transcripts of uh, interviews I'd done with men and women, mostly in the late 30s, early 40s, for a book I was going to do on the um, passages, uh, the crises of couples. And I noticed that most of them also had feelings of disequilibrium, dissatisfaction with the path they were on, uh, a time, feeling of time running out. Uh, some of them felt like they might be going crazy. Others were having creative breakthroughs. I thought, but they didn't have an external trauma like I did, an accident. 
um, this, so maybe there's something predictable about this age. And midlife crisis hadn't even come into the lexicon yet. So I began, I said, I have to do this story and <clears throat> I'm gonna take as long as it needs to take. Well, Clay at that time, I was living with him at that time, was Mr. New York. He was out every night at screenings and uh, dinner parties and you know, with his notebook and getting story ideas and he wanted me to be with him. Well, I couldn't write for him in his magazine and then come home and do bed bath and reading with my daughter and then be dressed the nines to go out with Clay and then somehow at one o'clock in the morning sit down and start working on a book. So I told him I just, I was just gonna have to move out because I was obsessed with this book and it was important that, he said, why are you leaving me now? And I said, well, there comes a time when the disciple has to leave the mentor and it's usually in the mid thirties. Um, otherwise, the, you become so attached and dependent that the mentor normally drops the disciple. Not, not fun. So he, we argued and finally he just said, well, let's just suspend it, but not end it. So I went off and got an apartment, of, you know, a sublet on the Upper West Side with my daughter and had solitude and, and began writing. And I would write every night. I'd put my daughter to bed, I'd take a little nap with her and then I'd go to my, the, you know, board in my bedroom and, and write. And um, it took three years. Um, I was sued by a uh, jealous psychiatrist who wanted to have, uh, intimidate me into having him as my collaborator. And I said, well, I, I've never had a collaborator. I've written four books. I don't really think that's appropriate. You can write your book and I'll write mine. And uh, he then kind of ingratiated himself and asked me to send me some of his, some of my interviews. And he commented on a few of them. And I had to write a, new, uh, a newsletter for, I was broke. So <clears throat> I applied to the um, Alicia Patterson Foundation for a, a, a loan and they, a grant, and they gave me one. But my obligation was to write for their newsletter about my research. So I wrote a, a piece for, for nothing about my research and the three or four uh, experts that I had been interviewing, one of whom was this psychiatrist, quoted him normal attribution. So he used it as a nuisance suit and said I had uh, plagiarized his ideas. And it was just to keep me from being able to finish the book. He knew I had no money. I couldn't afford a lawyer. So I finally said, well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the ninth month. I have to deliver this baby. I can't stand it anymore. And uh, so I just told the magazine lawyer, well, just give him 10% of my royalties because there aren't going to be any. So he's still earning. So to this day, yeah. he's still earning. Have you seen him since? No, we don't really have a relationship. You haven't, you're, yeah. <laughs> you're not going out and partying with him, no. No, well, actually, he later was um, quietly dismissed from one of the great universities in this town for mm, improper behavior. So he, he just wasn't the right kind of person on many levels, right? But you're mm -hmm. still subsidizing him indirectly. <laughs> but passages became so much more, if it's possible, than this incredibly important book. You turned it into a franchise, <coughs> which is a word I use reluctantly, because it's, but you, you, you mined the themes over and over again in so many wonderful and interesting ways, most notably for me personally, the silent passage, mm -hmm. but all, all are, and it, it, it's, I'd like you to talk a little bit about why you continued that theme, why that was so personally resonant for you when you were also at the same time a globe-trotting journalist. I'm gonna take this off because I'm getting warm with my cashmere. Oh, and I'll hold okay. It up. Um, oh, um, can we have some help out here actually with some audio? Because I think it might be better if we can pin the mic on. Maybe I could just put it on here and pinch yeah. it. Yeah, there. Okay, that's Is that good? good? That's great. Me? Yeah, okay. perfect. You're good at that. Um, can you talk about the twin sort of roles you have, you've given yourself over the course of your career from mm -hmm. passages onward where you, you looked at both worlds, stepped out into the world, but also mined the inner world so yeah. beautifully? 
Well, the reason I, I kept uh, returning to the passages theme, not exclusively, I was writing biographies and other books in between, but um, was because there was just, it, I kept breaking taboos or finding taboos to break, menopause being um, uh, a biggie. I mean, it was amazing. You think that this is the early 90s and mothers weren't even talking to daughters about menopause. It was like, mom, nobody ever spoke about it. And um, so <laughs> my editor was Tina Brown, uh, and she had, just had, she had just had a baby, and she was in that kind of like postpartum haze. And I went over to see her on a New Year's Day, and she said, now I, want you to, I want you to do the Pope. I said, do the Pope? <laughs> I said, I'm not even Catholic. You know? <laughs> um, wait a minute, I think we're getting a little overblown here. And she said, well, then what do you want to do? And I said, menopause. And she looked at me like, are you talking about another language? I mean, <laughs> when she said, well, if you think it's a trend, I said, it's definitely a trend. <laughs> <laughs> Only somebody in her 30s could say that, That's right? That's right, exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> off I went. And then, I mean, the, 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 book, the tour for that book was hilarious because these poor, poor men, would be behind. They're doing the new news, you know, they never heard of this thing. <laughs> so the producer puts a thing under their a paper under the saying, this is going to be a woman who you're going to be talking about menopause. The guy would go, what? <laughs> and <laughs> Run for the I'd notes. come up and he'd say, and this one guy on the Cleveland new news said, menopause, um, is that like impotence? <laughs> I said, uh, no, um, let's see, um, baldness. Is that like Alzheimer's? <laughs> <laughs> he got the joke, and then we began to talk. But I said, I'll bet your mother. Anyway, we got through it. Um, but it was amazing, because at the same time, there were women in Congress. That was the year of the woman, 92. And they began you know, calling for research. There was no research on menopause. It was just you know the feminine mystique, and you know, women who are supposed to take hormones are going to keep you forever young. So that was the year that they stood up the uh, Women's Health Initiative, which ultimately gave us answers about what we needed to do with about hormone replacement therapy and its dangers. So it was a, it was it was a wonderful feeling to have you know broken open something that every woman goes through, including Hillary Clinton. Actually, this was very funny. I, I actually followed Hillary Clinton into the ladies' room. That's how brash I was um, at a conference where we were both speaking. And she let down her hair. It was, that was by 95, and she, had been, she was being blamed for the Democrats' disastrous defeat in the midterm elections. And she said, I just don't know what to do anymore. Nothing I do works. And, uh, and she said, and I'm going through menopause. <laughs> Even first ladies go through menopause. Anyway, she thanked me for the silent passage, and then we began to talk, and we became really bonded. And then what stemmed from that was I wrote about the Clintons for 10 years for Vanity Fair, and then ultimately a biography called Hillary's Choice. And I'm still writing about her. just wrote an op-ed today for a newspaper about her. So she continues to fascinate so many of us. Yes, yes. I won't ask you about... Well, I can ask you about your feelings about her political chances. Why not? Let's talk about Well, that. I think her political chances are very good. It's, it's, um, what my big question was, every time she's asked, you know, why wouldn't you run? She comes up with a lot of very good reasons. Like, you know, she doesn't say this, but she has money. She can sleep late. You know, she has a <laughs> portable bully pulpit wherever she goes. She can know, start uh, a little revolution. Um, she's wildly admired, her very high approval ratings, until she got back into electoral politics. They started to go down as soon as she left the Secretary of State, where, where she used to be in the high 60s uh, as approval ratings. So um, you wonder, why would she want to you know, go back to the pillorying of Hillary, the sliming, the lying, everything that's going to happen to her? Uh, well, there's a very good reason, and that is that when she conceded <clears throat> to Barack Obama and took her three days to digest that failure, uh, she was making her concession speech in a big hall in Washington. It was filled with women who were just, you know, their hearts were aching. 
there were bitter, there were tears, and she said, do not waste any time thinking about the what ifs. We must work together for what still can be. And that seemed to just electrify that audience of women and women around the world who heard it because she was speaking to the crushing disappointments that every woman has had and getting up one more time than you're knocked down. Uh, and so she has all those women and many, many more, many daughters, uh, who are rooting for her and depending on her to make this breakthrough. And if she walked away from the chance, I think uh, I've heard from a lot of women that they would really, they might even hate her. Yes. I don't think she could take that. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about why you like writing profiles of these political figures? Let's talk about Margaret Thatcher and Bobby. There's so, there's so many people you mentioned in this book who you've profiled over the years. But it seems like your, your talent is looking behind the curtain, talking menopause with people who wouldn't normally talk about it. Well, I, I call them character portraits. Yeah. Uh, and I kind of introduced that form of profile writing. Uh, and it came under a great deal of criticism at the time. And that criticism has just been re revived. The cover of um, New York Times Magazine last Sunday, you know, a very well-written piece by Matt Bai, oh, yeah. but he kind of you know, exonerated Gary Hart you know, 40, 50 years later, um, saying that they should never have you know, followed him and invaded his private life because the Miami Herald team that did that hadn't really known in advance that Gary Hart had told another political reporter at the New York Times weeks before, put a tail on me. If you don't believe me about the womanizing, follow me around. What difference does it make if you told this one or you told that one? Those, those that team did read that, an advanced issue of that, um, of that piece, and so they knew that <clears throat> he had put this challenge out there. But Gary Hart's story is so much deeper than that. And it took me over 40, almost 50 interviews all around him, which is what I usually do, mm -hmm. to understand what the impact of his childhood being in the Nazarene church, which was it's a very, very, very strict fundamentalist sect. Uh, he was not allowed to uh, go to parties, drink, smoke, have sex, uh, any pleasures of the body or the mind, even go to movies, were all considered um, a sin against God. Mm. His mother had a fetish about cleanliness. She moved them to another rental house every year, sometimes in the same day. She would get rid of one and move to the next. So he was like a geek. You know, He was just not a part of the social mix and very isolated. And then he went through college in the Nazarene church. Then he came out and volunteered for McGovern's campaign. And suddenly, there are girls all over the place, and men are you know, romancing them. He's married. He already has two children, as he was supposed to with the church. So he just goes over the wall and becomes a libertine. But he's always got this you know, church thinking in his head. He has to get caught. He has to be punished. And a lot of the people who worked with him or knew him well said, as I, when I interviewed them, if you find out who Gary Hart really is, let me know. Because he would always push everybody away. Even when they were all crowding around him, marking up a Senate bill, all of a sudden he'd freeze and say, back off. And he even said to me, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a, an obscure man. I never reveal who I really am. Well, I feel like I kind of got to the other side of him, and because I went down to Turnberry Isle and I found all those girls and I knew what they were up to and I knew that they their whole idea was to lasso some presidential candidate or rich guy to take them to fame and fortune. Uh, and so the road to Bimini, which is where he was finally caught, kind of was almost predictable. And only by doing a month of reporting and many, many different interviews, and ultimately Hart himself, who I already knew was a little different, because I'd followed him in 84, when his first presidential race. And um, 
somebody uh, turned me on to a, uh, a Native American woman named Marilyn Youngbird. And she told me this fantastic story about how she and Hart were as close as this. They would go to Indian ceremonies and they would be brushed with eagle feathers and it would be so sensual and they were very close spiritually. And, and she gave me a, a message to hand to him, called, which was said, get away from everybody, hug a tree. So I'm on the campaign plane and I would be embarrassed to say this to a, you know, an adult running for the president uh, and Hart comes down the aisle, he's talking to me, and I said, I have a message from Marilyn Youngbird. And he said, do you know Marilyn? She's my spiritual advisor. What? And it got more and more bizarre. Finally, I said, well, Marilyn did tell me that her parents, who are medicine people, have pro pro prophesied that you have been chosen by God to save the world from environmental destruction. He said, I, he said, I know, she's always telling me that. I said, well, do you believe it? And she's, he said, yes. <laughs> We're talking megalomania here, right? <laughs> so writing that character portrait and laying it all out, I thought, you know, answered questions that so many of us continue to have around the Gary Hart story. Why would a man in his right mind challenge a major news organization to follow him and then invite Donna Rice to his townhouse to spend the weekend? Well, my interpretation was he needed to be caught. Is journalism an act of psychology? Do you consider yourself, is it, that, it looks like, or it reads like, sounds like you infuse your duty as a journalist, as a biographer. Well, that I think way. it's it's the it's a, it's a, it's always a mystery story. Whenever you're looking at somebody and trying to who is the real X, well, it's a mystery story, and you, so you're kind of a, an investigator. You know, you're kind of like a grown-up Nancy Drew. You're trying mm -hmm. to find not the flashlight, and you're trying to see inside and outside and see. There's always a contradiction. We have a dark side and a, and, a, and a bright side, all of us. And that doesn't necessarily mean somebody is not qualified to be a president or any other leader. They may, it may be, I mean, Churchill was that way and um, FDR was that way. Well, great leaders always have um, very complex characters. So trying to unravel that and lay it out helps us to know, to be informed about the kind of leader a man or woman might might become. And if you think about it, the, the, the leaders who have gone down, they haven't gone down because of their policies. Nixon didn't go down because he came up with a health care proposal that Mitt Romney ultimately used. He went down because of his character. He was a paranoid, you know, to, to a pathological degree. Uh, Lyndon Johnson went down not because he came up with the Civil Rights Act and, and the you know, impover and poverty programs, but because he had a habit of lying all of his life. And he lied through his teeth about Vietnam, and it finally caught up with him, and it just broke his spirit. Um, Bill Clinton, it, you know, he was a very popular president, and he gave us peace and prosperity. He had a little character flaw, and uh, it almost it, you know, threw him out of the White House. So, I say character is what was yesterday and will be tomorrow. Issues are what's today. It's interesting to hear you talk now because in the book you write about how when you got your first assignment to mine politics, yeah. that was not your thing. You were not, you were reluctant. Well, yes, because um, Clay had a huge voice and he was very, you know, incredibly charismatic and somewhat dogmatic. And so he came to my apartment one day and he said, uh, what do you know about politics? And I said, well, my father's a country club Republican, my mother's a you know, born again, I mean, a born bomb throwing Irish rebel. So what I know about politics is arguing at the dinner table. And he said, great, then you'll understand Bobby. I said, well, Bobby who? He said, Bobby Kennedy. Said, Bobby Kennedy? He said, yes, I want you to cover his California campaign. You know, you've got to leave two days, two days. I said, I, I've never written a political story in my life. He said, that, now's the time to start. <laughs> he said, look, Gail, he said, don't, you know, you can write as many little stories as you like, no matter how interesting they are, nobody's gonna remember them, they're not gonna start a new conversation. 
if you want to make your name as a journalist, you have to write a, tackle a big story, something everybody's talking about, but they don't know the why. So I thought, I, he gave me one day to think about it, and I took the dare, and I went, and it was kind of amazing. Uh, we had to go through, to, through Oregon one day. None of the senior journalists wanted to fly um, because it was a little tiny plane, rain squalls, it was going to be a yo-yo trip up and down the Cascade Mountains. So I got to go. And I'm sitting in the back, and there's a seat empty next to the senator. And all of a sudden, he says, hey, New York, you want to sit up here? Said, New York, that's me. He's actually asking me to sit next to him. So I'm sitting next to him. We have a wonderful interview. Um, actually, very, something very poignant happened. He asked for his brother's uh, overcoat, put it over his lap. And he, JFK had been assassinated five years before, and he was still wearing his brother's clothes. Uh, so we had a very uh, uh, inter internalized interview. And all of a sudden, as we're approaching Seattle, another plane comes straight at us, which we can't see. And suddenly our plane drops like a stone. Men are screaming. My stomach turns over. And right in the middle of the drop, Bobby Kennedy quips, I knew Gene McCarthy was desperate. Didn't know he was that desperate. <laughs> <laughs> so that gave me the insight. This man was a fatalist. He'd had so many deaths in his family that he knew to expect it. He knew he was a target. Everywhere he went, that I followed him he would talk about restricting guns. Uh, and what happened a day after I interviewed him, he was gunned down. So it, was a, it, it made, a, it made a, an important story. And that gave me the courage to do more stories where I didn't know anything about the person, but I knew that I could find out. Reading your book, I gasped every few pages at even though I was familiar with your work, strung together uh, from transcendental meditation, um, <laughs> prostitution. I thought they were going to put up the, the hooker story from <laughs> New York. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it was like to step back at this moment in your life and chronicle your life in this book? It must have been incredibly difficult and joyful, I would hope. Too. Well, both, yeah. I mean, it was an excavation process, you know, and really, you know, prying open your guts and, you know, really looking inside and um, could I have done that better? And wow, how did I do that? How, how did I do all that when this was going on? And stringing it together. And I remember uh, being really stunned. The second chapter I wrote was about my childhood. I really didn't want to write about my childhood because I didn't think it was very exciting. I mean, you know, I didn't have a mafia family member. I hadn't been raped by my father. I mean, there was no really big thing. And um, at the end of it, I was writing about how my father had helped me as a writer. As a young kid, we used to sit on the floor, make up stories together. And he was very supportive. Uh, and I was sort of tying up that theme at the end of the chapter. My sister, my younger sister, read it and said, Gail, don't you remember all of the stories that you sent, the magazine stories that you sent to our father, and all the books that you sent him? He never read a word because you were more successful than he. Mm. Wow. I had to go back and you know reconstruct my relationship with my father and his view of me and that impact. And, uh, so, and so it was with my mother, you know, with my um, first husband, I, who was I, was, I put him through medical school, and we had this wonderful life plan, and then I was going to have babies, and I would work from home as a writer, and he'd make the money, and so and all of a sudden, he turns out to be unfaithful. And I'm 28 years old, and I have to walk away. With a child. Right? Have a divorce, failed marriage. And what does that mean? I have a two-and-a-half-year-old child. I'm a single mother. You know, back in the, in the 1960s, being a single mother wasn't exactly, you know, a point of pride. And I had to scramble to make money, to, you know, make a living, work full-time for the Herald Tribune, and, but I didn't want to leave my toddler home with the kinds of babysitters that I could afford. I mean, people, women whose boyfriends would leave their pipmobiles under my fourth-floor walk-up. 
So I quit my job and said, I have to set up as a freelance writer. But who's going to take me seriously? There aren't any women in journalism to speak of. And um, so I sat down and wrote my first book. And I was very proud of that. Got a car contract from Random House. It was, that was a big dare. It failed. Well, then I had to get up off my despair and say, yeah, but you learned something from that. What a reason it failed really was because it was written just a couple of years before the women's movement broke open. And so it, it, was, it was one of those reviews that said, let's put the lid back on this. We don't want to hear about a marriage that fell apart for no good reason. You know, some uppity woman wants to walk out of a marriage. So um, I had then wrote three more books before, pa before Passages. Let's talk about Clay, because he was such a major influence to so many people, obviously, to you as your editor, as a mentor, as your husband. <laughs> what a charismatic, huge personality. People I know who've worked with him over the years huh? or knew him or studied with him. Um, he <clears throat> shaped you, a team of people, you, oh, many chief people. among them, who really changed the course of, of journalism. Yes. Well, he gave us the, um, the freedom and the pages to practice what we call the new journalism. Uh, it was Tom Wolfe who gave it that title. But what it was was uh, instead of doing who, what, when, where, why, giving you all the you know, pertinent information in the first paragraph so that you didn't have to really read the story. It's sort of more like today's Twitter. Um, we were using the techniques of fiction to enliven the story, to and mesh ourselves, saturation reporting, we called it, and then use dialogue, scene setting, characterization, uh, and, and interpretation. Uh, so it became really involving, you know, more like reading a short story. Uh, and it was totally new. And the magazine, New York Magazine, was the first city magazine ever. Uh, so that was totally new. And we were, just a young, you know, a bunch of young kids, most of us suburbanites, who come to New York City, and we all brought our own fantasy to New York, and that fantasy showed up in all these stories as we were discovering our New York. Uh, and as Clay would often say, you know, he said, I can't tell you a formula that I use for New York Magazine when people would ask him, he said, I just, it's, it's what interests me, and what interests me seems to interest a lot of other people. Uh, so we had a wonderful um, familial, uh, collegial relationship because Clay would have, well, first of all, we were in a little garret on the fourth floor. So everybody who would come up the stairs, I mean, you'd get up to the top of the fourth floor with these very steep steps and almost have cardiac arrest. And then you'd walk in and so Clay would suddenly appear because it was a completely open plan. And he'd say, look who's here. And you'd feel, oh my God, I've been anointed. And then you'd had you know, 30 seconds to give him your new story idea. And if it wasn't really good, you kind of crawl out with your <laughs> tail between your legs. Um, so it was wonderful. And then we would have um, weekly uh, editorial lunches. <clears throat> Everybody wanted to be one of the chosen 10 for that week. And they were held at the Palm, which is right near the UN. And George H.W. Bush would always be in the background with another lady which was interesting. Um, and, and we would, instead of arguing or you know, shooting each other down while we were trying to be the one who gets the chosen story, we would help each other and say, well, I know something about that, or I can tell you a little about it, Billy Graham. Or, and um, so we became very close as a family. And we're still, we still have these family ties. I just saw two of my former colleagues last night for dinner. Talk about some of the names. It was Gloria Steinem. <coughs> oh, Gloria Steinem, um, Tom, Wolf, uh, Tom Wolf, Jimmy Breslin, uh, uh, Richard Reeves, who lives here now and teaches at USC, a wonderful presidential biographer, uh, Aaron Latham, uh, Steve Brill, who started American Lawyer right. and Court TV. Um, it just went on and on. Uh, and many of them were started their own magazines, and many, many went on to be art directors, or like about 100, to art directors of other magazines and publications. And what, one of the things that Reeves said that I loved was, you know, Clay, Clay he was always um, said to, to use this line, I can make you a star, 
but and he did use that line, but he did he was better than that. He actually let you make yourself a star and gave people their voice. Uh, and he respected writers so much that um, he, he never wanted to write himself. And one of the, I was always, I wanted to, him to write his own autobiography. Mm. I interviewed him, I had lots of tapes and so on, but he would never do it. He would always wheedle out of it because he knew he just wasn't a writer that he would respect. He was a true editor. He was a true editor. In the Twitter age, I'm curious what you, would, what you think about when you look at this age and perhaps being a young journalist now. Well, I think it's, it's very tough. It's a very tough field to go into now uh, for young people. First of all, they you know, have to go through one or two or three internships, which may or may not be paid. Um, they're likely to be you know, writing, working free for something like Huffington Post. Uh, they um, to to freelance. You have to, you know, be have ten different irons in the fire and going from one thing to another. So you can never really develop a big story or develop a, a persona for yourself as a journalist. Um, but there are, you know, we're in such a transitional period. Some of these internet publications will really become much more robust, and I hope some of them will. Uh, eventually allow for long-form journalism because what we're losing as we become more and more Twitterized is context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the why. Um, that's what the, that was what magazines provided. The newspaper would give you the headlines, television would give you the visuals, and magazines would come along weeks or months later and give you, you know, what happened, what was the why? Where did ISIS come from, you know? Uh, why didn't we know about them? So there's only a handful of publications that do that anymore. Uh, the, the Atlantic, The New Yorker, New York Magazine, The New York Times Magazine, The New York Times Daily, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I don't want to leave any out, but there, there aren't very many. Very few. Yeah, very few people who have that ability or that space to process. Just to have the space yeah. and, the, and, the, um, and the expense account to spend a month on a story or longer. And that, that, as you say, will have a cascading effect on our social fabric, I would think. Absolutely, yeah. Governance. You know, we live in the now. We live in, you know, BuzzFeed, Twitter, you know, what just happened? Well, what happened yesterday? Who said that? And then, well, when you put that together in whatever field you're talking about, what does that mean? For where, how do we get here? You know, do we like it here, or do we need to reform? I want to ask you, I think we're probably getting ready to go to questions. I can't see Ted, but um, before we do, I want to ask you, it's so interesting to me how you would dip into a subject and then bring that back into your world, and in no, no better example than with Cambodia, uh -huh. because, of course, that changed your life and the course of your daughter's life. Can we right. talk a little bit about that? Because I don't know how many people are aware. Well, there's actually a, um, an excerpt from the book in uh, the current Vogue, in Vogue uh, right. about, about uh, finding Mom, M-O-H-M, as we renamed her. Um, <clears throat> well, the funny thing was that I had just finished a book tour, uh, and I was exhausted, and I got a call from Clay saying, I want you to come to Asia. Let's do Asia together. Well, boy, was I ready. So <laughs> I flew off. We met. And uh, we wound up our three-week trip in, um, uh, in uh, Thailand at the Oriental Hotel, one of the most beautiful hotels in the world. We were on the veranda overlooking the Klong, and these great barges are going down like hippopotami in, the, in midst the you know, lovely water lilies. And I, Clay is reading the paper, and his usual thing, coming up with a brilliant idea, he says, you know, I know you're really feeling down about Mora going off to college. Maybe there's a child for you here. I said, here? Where? He said, well, there are all these kids who are Cambodian refugees from the genocide of Pol Pot, and they're stuck in uh, refugee camps here in Thailand. And, uh, Reagan has shut down the pipeline to America. So maybe there's a child for you here. And I was totally stunned. I never thought of adoption, never thought of foreign adoption. 
Well, and you, know, you had just married Clay. It's important. Uh, we just we hadn't even married. You yet. hadn't married. No, yet. we had. We were close, but not quite yet. <laughs> and um, he couldn't. He could not say the words. He couldn't say the words. I mean, he just didn't. So, anyway, um, within a half an hour, I said, "Okay, we're going to those camps. We have to go to the camp." He said, "Today, on our last day." I said, "Well, when else?" So we went. We weren't able to see kids that day because there had been kidnappings. So we flew back, and from the airport, I called the New York Times Magazine, and I said, I want to go to Cambodia, go back to Cambodia, and write about the refugees America forgot. And because you know what we did to Cambodia. And he said, well, that's a pretty expensive trip. And I said, well, I'll pay half. So a week later, I'm back in the, Cambodia, I, I have all these children lined up to see me, and I'm talking about 10, 11, 12, 13-year-olds. Uh, and the last one is canceled. She had a class. So this other, I was asked if I would accept a substitute. And this beautiful young child, 12 years old, hair completely freshly washed and long and draped down her front, and a freshly, you know, pressed sarong comes before me. And I said, oh, I'd be delighted to interview her. So she sits down, and our eyes just locked right from the beginning. And my first question was, with a translator, have you ever known a happy time? Well, her whole demeanor changed, because nobody had ever had time to ask such a frivolous question. And she smiled, and she started talking about living in a, in a nice house with Bougainville, and her father would go to work on a motorcycle. He was a motorcycle policeman, and her mother was um, would read stories to them. And then we went through the interview and finally got to talking about her parents, and I said, do you know how they died? And she, her face began to break up, and she put her head down and just silently sobbed. And the translator and the head of the children's wing and I were all sobbing, but she waited until she was completely composed, took her head up again, and was ready to resume the interview. And I knew then that she had not accepted the identity of refugee, of displaced, that she had, she might have the strength of will to come to another alien culture. And so we finished our interview, and we went outside. I asked if I could take a picture. And then suddenly she melted into the crowd. And I, all these other people pressed in on me with their letters, begging me to take them back to the United States to ask for acceptance. And I called out, I said, what's her name? And she called back and said, Mom. And that was the name her parents had given her to, it just meant little girl, so she wouldn't be identified as part of the intelligentsia. So I went back to New York and I wrote her letters, and she never got mine, and she wrote me a letter saying she'd like to come to America and live with me, and I, she never knew I got her letter. I tried everything to bring her out, but I was also writing op-ed pieces about our refugee policy and criticizing the government, and so my former ambassador to Cambodia told me, they're going to punish you, they're never going to let you bring Mom out. And um, so one day, it's literally nine months later. I was just coming in from running in the Central Park and pushed my answering machine, and I hear Pat Mom arriving tomorrow night, JFK, 8.30 p.m. Out of the blue. Um, so I you know, got into my little car and rushed out to JFK, stopped at a Chinese restaurant to get Chinese rice, which Cambodians hate. <laughs> And uh, this little girl comes off the plane with a tiny little plastic bag with her, all of her possessions in it, and at the bottom a little, a little pocketbook with my letter all folded up. And all she knew was she was coming to a place on a map that was yellowed in called New York. Uh, and we just linked arms and strode out of the, in, the, in, in sync right from the beginning. And within months, uh, she had learned English well enough to be able to dictate stories to me for her English class. And your daughter, Mora, embraced her and Maura, as well. who was then had just gone, started school at Brown, uh, embraced her and made her a great sister. 
Um, and we learned a great deal from her. Clay was totally besotted by her because <laughs> she figured she knew how to get wind him around her little finger. She just, <laughs> I had taken her to a Cambodian uh, classical dance teacher and she'd given her a costume. So when, when Clay first came, Mo took one look at him and knew there was something going on between the two of us. So she goes in, puts on her costume, comes out, puts on a record, and dances for him, Cambodian, you know, dance. Well, he's like completely over the top. And um, very shortly thereafter, we married and adopted her together. In writing this book, you, you could have written a hundred other books. I'm sure you have a hundred other books in your head that you'd like to write. Why a memoir now? What, <clears throat> what, what, because it, especially since it is so difficult to, to encapsulate your life. Well, I thought it was only fair. You know, I'd spent, well, maybe 40 years of asking uh, questions about passages to hundreds, maybe even thousands of women and men. Um, and I figured it was time to turn the lens on my own passages. Um, you know, the good and the bad, and, uh, and kind of lay it out there and say, I'm one of you, and I've made some mistakes, and I've had some triumphs, but I've had an incredibly fascinating life, and, and I was finally able to answer the question, which I think is a, 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 an inappropriate question, you know, can you have it all? Most people don't have it all, or certainly don't have it all at once. But what I found in my life was I didn't, it was only when I became, got to midlife that I really knew what was important. And so then it was about having enough. Do you have enough self-respect? Do you have enough accomplishment in your life? Do you have enough mutual love with people who are important to you? Do you have enough uh, to give away? Um, those are the important things. And if, when you have enough, you're in the best place in your life. And then, you know, nobody has it all forever because you begin losing things as you get older. And you have to be prepared for that too and prepared for replacing with other things as, you, as friends die off or move away. You have to make younger friends. Um, you know, most women will be widowed at some time. Many men will be widowed. Most of us will be caregivers when we're women in their late 40s and 50s today are most of them, that's the, 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 the age group that is most hit with having, still having adolescent kids or kids at home and taking care of mom or dad. Right. Just as they want to really, you know, branch out and uh, take advantage of freedom. So uh, I think it's, it's just a, um, a false illusion to set as the ideal having it all. Is that what you tell your daughters? Well, I don't think I tell my daughter what to have or not have anymore. And she's 50 years old, so she knows exactly what she wants to do, <laughs> living her own life. I'm looking good. OK, great. Um, I, I have a question. Uh, thank, thank you so much. It's, um, it's, I'm up here. It's really up here. Raise your hand. I can't see you. It's hard to see. Can we yeah. have the house lights up a little bit? Here. OK. It, it's really inspiring to, to hear you talk, and, and the LA Times article got me running here. Um, oh, good. Having just cared for my dad with dementia and Alzheimer's and losing a job over it. But I, I mm. wanted to get back to um, how, how, how you got to New York at, uh, Magazine and how Clay became your mentor first. How did, how did that happen? Okay. Well, um, in the mid-60s, I was um, the only place that a female journalist could be in the women's department, in the women's department of the Herald Tribune. Uh, and one day, <clears throat> I decided I was going to sneak down the back stairs and get out, you know, the flamingo pink women's department and cross into, cross the enemy lines into the city room, the testosterone zone, and I was going to go to the office of Clay Felker, who was remaking journalism at that time, so exciting, and pitch him my best story. Well, I could have gotten fired for this because my editor would be furious if she knew I was taking my best story to another editor, a man, on the paper. So I was outside his door, and he's on the phone. 
and he had a really, really big voice, and I hear him saying, what do you mean you don't have my reservation? Clay Felker, the pool room, my usual table, I'm bringing a senator, my wife's opening on Broadway? Thinking, I want to shrink into a mollusk. I mean, who am I? I mean, one of my boyfriends at that time described me as a skinny, brainy chick. And he didn't mean it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Clay? He says, where did you come from? I said, the estrogen zone? <laughs> so he laughed and he said, what have you got for me? I knew I had 30 seconds to tell, you know, spit this out. And I knew I'd get tongue-tied, so I'm saying, well, it's a story about um, loser men, and they rent a big house on Fire Island, and they're um, auditioning girls, beautiful women, to, to come, you know, have free rooms and sit on their beach blanket to attract other beautiful women, um, you know, like flypaper, and they're having specimen viewing parties. Specimen viewing parties? Did you go to one? I said... Of course. He said, well, then write it just like you describe it. Write it as a scene. We'll call it the flypaper people. <laughs> write journalism as a scene? This was totally new. Right? He just dared me to jump off the edge, and that was my first plunge into new journalism. So then the, uh, happened, you know, then this divorce happened, and I had to give up my job. <clears throat> to take care of my child. And I started freelancing, and a, a year after the Herald Tribune died, Clay started New York Magazine, and I was one of the female writers that he uh, pulled in, along with Gloria and, and several others of us, Julie, uh, and so on. And they, and we were, it was the first time, I mean, Gloria Steinem was the first female political writer to speak of, um, I was writing feature stories and uh, all, you know, practically every other week. And it was just like, wow, you know, we're taken seriously. No turning back once you write that the way that you were authorized to by Clay. That's yeah. right, yeah. No more who, what, when, where, and why. Hi, um, I was wondering if you had some suggestions for uh, women in professions that are still dealing with some of the, uh, probably not nearly as much as you dealt with in the 60s and 70s, but profound sexism that interferes on a daily basis with our ability to, to do virtually anything. Wow. Um, I, I represent the interests of a number of trial lawyers, women like myself, and we're ready to stage a revolt and be bold. And I was just wondering good, what good. ideas you might have. Well, then, what are you waiting for? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I do think at a certain point, if you've tried every other diplomatic way, um, <clears throat> and you have you know, a core group that um, is valuable to your profession or to your professional group, that you just, you don't, you know, you just have to t be bold enough to take the risk that you might just all get fired, which is unlikely if you're very valuable. Um, but to make the statement, you know, this has to change. And, um, you, you know, you can do it with grace and humor, but seriousness. <clears throat> and, you know, that's, what, um, that's where feminism was born, in like a newsroom of Newsweek, where women just, you know, struck. Uh, and another one of the magazines, Red Book magazine, all the women who were, you know, typing as secretaries and so on, but they wanted to be writers too. They just finally came and surrounded the desk of the editor and said, "We're not going to go away until you give us uh, better jobs." And they just hung there for a day. The guy couldn't, you know, get out to go to the men's room. <laughs> he finally changed. So um, I think that that's sometimes that's the only way, and it's a good way. Does it it's, it's an American way. Does it amaze you that that mentality still prevails that a woman in this day and age? Say is... that. Well, I'm not really surprised. Um, I, I hear it so much of the time. You know, on the other hand, you know, the Fortune 500. I mean, the Fortune Fortune magazine always comes up with the top ten most powerful women, and they're women CEOs in very important. Positions. I mean, the head of who would have thought, you know, 30 years ago that there would be a woman at the head of General Motors 
well, who would have thought that General Motors would turn out the way General Motors turned out? <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we, that Fortune keeps finding out is the women who do get to these very, very top senior corporate positions where they're literally working 24 hours a day, mostly are married to men who are happy to be at home husbands and support. child care support. Or they're retired, they have, it's interesting to them to take you know, the leadership with adolescent kids. Um, so, but the, you know, I, one of the things I hear a lot only from men is when they ask questions about Hillary, they'll say, well, do you think we're ready for a woman president? And I say, who's we? <laughs> Women are ready. <laughs> are, when are you going to be ready? So we have a long way to go still. Yes. <laughs> You read. Who do you enjoy reading? What's your reading routine like? Oh well, I, I still I love magazines, the the good magazines that have long form. I read the New Yorker every week. I read New York Magazine every week. Um, I I read the um, the Atlantic every month. Uh, I go to I go to a lot of conferences, like the Aspen Institute conference and and. Um, the Renaissance weekend and so on. I love having, um, hearing when, you know, brilliant minds get together. And then I read books, and I'll always have three or four books on my night table at the same time, and they'll be very varied. I mean, there'll be a novelist or a short story. There'll be um, <laughs> the Piketty book about the new economy, which I try <laughs> to make myself read a few pages, and then um, I you know, go to Kirsten Gillibrand's new, uh, uh, it's really pr pretty much of a memoir. Um, and there's a new book called, you know, Is Israel Good for the Jews? I mean, I'm all over the place. I just, I can't get enough of reading. I often don't get to read the whole book, but I do read at least some of it and get the sense of it. And then I'll often read an excerpt and no more. Real books or digital books? Both. I really like to read real books because I'm a compulsive yellow highlighter and um, it's not as easy to do that on a tablet. But I love seeing, walking up and down the aisles in, in a plane, you know, so many people on all their different tablet devices being totally engrossed in a book. This is good. This is a good thing. Yes. Is there anybody you haven't interviewed who oh. you wish you could? I'm sure there are. Oh, oh loads of people, loads of people, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, every, anyone from you know, Claire McGaskill who, and Elizabeth Warren to Vladimir Putin. The only problem with Putin is that two Russian women have written biographies of him, and they both ended up dead. <laughs> Might be might be just as interesting to interview the people of Pussy Riot, I think. Pussy Riot, absolutely. <laughs> I'd like to see your take on the Pussy yeah. Riot gals. Final question. How approachable was Margaret Thatcher? Can you talk a little bit about uh, doing that book, please? Oh well, she was. Uh, it was a hoot. Um, you, most people would not think Margaret Thatcher was sexy. Well. I interviewed 40 people again around her before I met her, and a um, number of them were her star boys, and these were very handsome, like American matinee idols from the 30s that she surrounded herself with, and several of them said that they found Mrs. T sexually attractive in a rather packaged way. <laughs> Morally. So... <laughs> I had to look into that, and what I learned was that she had an, in, an Indian uh, guru um, named, who called herself Madame uh, Veronique. And Madame Veronique had a, a salon on the outskirts of London where some of the top women, including Pamela Harriman and Princess Di, would go to get electrical baths. Electrical baths? 
And Margaret Thatcher, my whole question was, why does she look 20 years younger when she's in her 60s than she did? And why is she dressing with shortened her, shortened her skirts and lowered her decollete? What's going on here? So I, go, I finally get an introduction to Madame Veronique under false pretenses. And I go in, and there's this big tub. And she tells me to strip and climb up to the top of the steps. And I'm standing there thinking, buck naked, you know, I've done a lot of things for a story, but I don't know if electrocution is one of them. <laughs> and she says, I, my dear, she said, I have had kings and princes and little bitty emirs in that tub. Step in. So I stepped in and I'm being parboiled and she's putting, you know, <laughs> garlic and salts and herbs and being cooked. And, you know, I come out and she does a rub down and then uses essential oils. And she says, go back to the hotel, have no alcohol for 24 hours, don't even eat supper, just sleep for 12 hours and you'll get up and feel like a million dollars. And I did. <laughs> it was amazing, it worked. Um, so I called my editor, Tina Brown, and I said, I'm getting so much from Madame Veronique, I have to go back for another interview. <laughs> <laughs> but she really did give me the lowdown. And um, so when I met Mrs. Thatcher, I was able to ask her, you know, many questions that many people wouldn't have thought of and, uh, and, and write a, a really interesting profile, I think. And this was only one funny aspect of it. It was a much more in-depth profile about what it was like to be the grocer's daughter and live, you know, over an alley, a thieves' alley behind her bedroom window. And from the front window of their grocery store, you could see these uh, Victorian um, townhouses of young professionals. And that's what she wanted to be, you know, and not the poor kids. So she did got herself into... Cambridge and took elocution lessons and, you know, became what the aristocracy called a jumped up woman. You know, they never forgave her for coming from the middle class. Uh, so she always had to prove herself. But she was, she was a, an incredible piece of work. Uh, and I ultimately wrote a little play about her and Mikhail Gorbachev because I saw the sparks between them and I've written a lot about that in this book. Um, they had a magnetic kind of romantic uh, liaison, not really, not played out, but he wanted to be taken seriously as a European. She picked him out of the crowd as being the next general secretary of the Soviet Union before anybody knew and endorsed him. And she used her powers of, of um, seduction with him and with Ronald Reagan to help bring them together and help to end the Cold War. So, you know, who would have thought? <laughs> and the electrical bath had something to do with it. It had something to do with it, that's right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gail. It's really a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa.